You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Filmmaking Conversations with Damian Swaby. Listen to conversations with award-winning filmmakers, directors from the golden age of television, and creatives from the indie film community who continue to inspire the next generation of filmmakers. And now, over to your host, Damian Swaby. Step into the sonic world of storytelling with our special guest, James David Redding III, a master sound designer known for captivating audiences through his work on The Patient, Carol, and the phenomenal Queen's Gambit. Today, we dive deep into some great stories from James himself. In this episode, we pull back the curtain to explore the most daunting episode of Mr. and Mrs. Smith from an audio perspective and discover where sound truly brought the Queen's Gambit to life. We compare the delicate nuances of layering sound between the historical echoes of the Queen's Gambit and the modern tones of American Rust and uncover unique Foley sounds that set the eerie ambience of a decaying town. All of this and a whole lot more, right here where story meets sound. James, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Damien? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Speaking to you, which is excellent. I've wanted to speak to you for a while and you're, talk about your amazing body of work and everything that you've done and how you got there. And before we continue into it, your name is not unusual, but it's quite grand. It sounds... <laughs> <laughs> I That's do get that a lot. A lot of people are like, are you royalty? No, yeah. <laughs> I'm just James. No, I'm. I, my name does get that a lot. It, it's it's a family name, obviously, hence why I'm the third. And what gets really funny is growing up, my parents always distinguish me from my father by calling me by my middle name. Yeah. So I was always called that growing up. And then you know, as I got into the professional world, because of all the tax documents and everything like that, I always had to fill out my real legal first name. And I was just like, you know what, instead of causing confusion when people hire me, I'll just go by James professionally. So professionally, I'm known as James, but familiarly, I'm known as Dave. Oh. And then what gets even crazier is if you go to my college days, I was a radio DJ there. And my radio name was Dave, Dave, the radio guy. So That's everybody from my college calls me Dave, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so I have three different names out there in the world and it, it sort of helps me keep, you know, my life separate so that I know where people know me from. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I do like that radio name. That's a cool yeah. name. And that, that's a really cool name. I had a, a contest my first time on air and I told the listeners, I said, look, what, what do you want to call me? And this one girl who I still actually keep in touch with, Lisa, was like, you should go by Dave, Dave, the radio guy. And I was like, OK, yeah, that works. And uh, yeah, so for four years at Ithaca College, I was known as Dave, Dave, the radio guy. And to this day, because in our industry, there are a lot of people in the film and television industry that went to Ithaca College. And I they it's funny because I come across people like at union meetings or just on projects. In fact, I was working on a a project one time for Martin Scorsese when he was getting the Cecil B. DeMille award and Thelma came in his editor to approve the reel that we we're doing for the award show. And she called up her assistant editor and she's talking to her assistant red. And I'm like, I don't know many people in picture departments named red. So I just mm -hmm. asked her, I said, you know, by any chance, do you know, did red go to Ithaca college? And she on the phone is like, Hey, Red, did you go to Ithaca College? And he's like, Yeah. And I was like, Tell him Dave, Dave, the radio gets guy says hi. And she's like, Red, my mixer is saying, <laughs> Dave, Dave, the radio guy says hi. And I just heard Red scream through the phone, Oh my God, you're working with Dave, Dave. That's awesome. And Thelma's was looking at me like, Your name is James. What is going <laughs> on? <laughs> Yeah, that is very, very separate. I wouldn't know can it make the connection either. Dave, Dave, the radio guy, James. They're, they're very well, different. Now, now all my radio stalkers know where I am, so. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to come and find you. But if anyone ever said your full name, like out loud somewhere, James David Redding III, that sounds very. 
Only my mother and my wife when they're angry. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Not very often, I hope. Not very often. Not very often. But again, James, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Love your work and everything like that. Thank you. And man. a lot of people may have listened to other podcast interviews you've done. I've listened to some and I've read a lot about you. One thing I'm always interested in when I have guests come on the podcast is that many people get into the industry in very different ways. They may start off learning one thing and then they become something else. They go to university or film school and they say they're going to be a director. Then after that first year, they say, no, I'm not. I don't want to do that. I'm interested in screenwriting or or sound editing or, or what it may be. I've noticed that you have a history in music as well. Can you tell us about your history in music and how that linked to you becoming a sound designer? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it, we all sort of have a connection to sound and music and, and whatnot throughout our lives. We Music is one of those things in our lives that connects us to different moments of life, right? Mm. We, can always, we can always recall songs. We can always recall stuff like that. Growing up, my parents weren't very musical, but we did. We were surrounded by music. My sisters all learned music in school. We took music classes. And I got very interested in you know music as a whole and really when i was young i wanted to be the rock star right i remember you know guns and roses coming out and i just wanted to be the consummate rock star i wanted to be like slash obviously hair thing did not work out <laughs> but that's what i wanted and then you know as i got into high school there was nirvana and the grunge revolution and and i joined a bunch of bands and played guitar and got really into it but I realized one thing very early on is that I have great ideas of how I want songs to go, but I don't have what I, I didn't have the musical chops to make it happen. So what I found though, is that I really liked recording my friends bands and my own band and, and experimenting with that. And I, I had a neighbor who gave me a reel to reel recorder back in the nice. day. And I just, I mean, I messed with the thing. I didn't just, put it into record and go. I, I found out what happened if I slowed it down. What happened if I sped it up? What happened if I used other recorders to play into that recorder and, and bounce tracks back and forth and come up with weird compositions that way? And I was like, wow, this is a lot of fun. And this was all through grade school and high school, never getting into a professional studio because at the time it wasn't really just easy for a high schooler to walk into a, a pro studio. But then I went to college and, and when I went off to college, my parents said, you have to get a real job. Music is not mm -hmm. that. And so my mom said, you like poetry, you like the arts. Why don't you look into English and teaching? And I was like, okay, you know, I had to pick a major. And in my mind, I had to do these things. Like this was like the path that you had to follow. So, so I, I, I went in as an English major at Ithaca College for one semester. <laughs> <laughs> one semester. And, and while I was there, I got involved in radio, like I said, and I really liked that. And they had this great major concentration that you could do at Ithaca College called television and radio. And you can concentrate in just audio side of things. And I said, that's what I want to do. So I dropped my English major. I switched schools. I went from the art school to the communication school. And got into doing audio there. And at the time, I thought I really wanted to do radio and still music. Really thought that was going to be my path, but not so much being a musician as much as being maybe a producer or, you know, a mixer of that type. And while I was at college, I, you know, got in, all, all my friends around me at the, the school communication school, the Park School of Communications, a lot of them were filmmakers. Right. And you know, and talking to them and I was like, oh, this is cool, you know, and, and, you know, they, we did different movies and stuff like that. I still didn't actually do audio for them. I just sort of got involved. And partway during my college career, Ithaca has a program where you could go and study abroad. And so I went from Ithaca, New York to Los Angeles, California, because that was about as broad as my mind would let me go. <laughs> but LA is kind of its own world, which was very interesting. And while I was in Ithaca, while I was in LA, I, again, still thought I was going to do radio and I, I applied to radio positions and they just weren't landing. And I happened to come across this other one that sounded very interesting. It was for a company called Dane Tracks with Dane A. Davis, who is a very well-renowned sound designer. And 
I was just like, well, this sounds cool. And I went and I met with Dane. Like it was like my interview was with Dane. And I was like, well, this is cool. And he was like, yeah, we'll bring you in. And, you know, we're working on this Warner Brothers project. We can't say too much about it yet. You can't tell people about it. You're going to have to sign an NDA. And I was like, okay. And he shows me a couple frames of it. And it's Keanu Reeves hanging, you know, bald in the middle of a slime pit. And I'm like, what is going on here? And it ended up being this film called The Matrix. Oh, um, excellent. And so my internship was hanging out with Dane as he came up with some of the coolest sounds in cinema doing the matrix. And that just, that hooked me. That was like, forget the music stuff, figure yeah. out how to do this. Yeah. And I learned a lot from Dane. And when I returned back to finish up my college career at Ithaca, I just dove right into just doing sound effects and sound design and dialogue editing and everything. And I did probably my senior year at school. I did probably, I want to say close to 90% of the films that were done at the school, just going in and, and whether it was just mixing them or, them. yeah, I mean, there weren't a lot of us that were doing audio post-production for film at the school. So mm -hmm. it was sort of like this, you know, I was an oddity. It was me and a couple other guys. And so we, you know, but I dove right in and I, I pretty much spent my, my last year of college just doing audio for film. And then, you know, once I graduated, I went on the job hunt and landed a couple of great jobs in the beginning. I got to intern with Ron Bokar at C5 only for two days, <laughs> but, but that's, that was, that showed me sort of how the industry kind of was. Because yeah. Ron brought me in and then he was like, all right, well, you can come in, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, but then the project goes on hiatus. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, you know, I didn't understand hiatuses. I, I came up in the, the very traditional, you know, old school, middle-class America. My father worked at the same engineering company for 40 years, Yeah, you know, like he nine to five every day. It was like, so this whole idea of like, oh, the project goes on hiatus and I just don't have work. That's interesting. But, <laughs> but Ron was great enough to introduce me to Nick Renbeck, who was working there at the time, and also introduced me to a man named Danny Cacavo, who was at a studio called Sync Sound at the time. And Danny said, well, Sync Sound is hiring assistants. So, you know, why don't we see if we can get you in on that? And, and from there, Danny got me my first interview at Sync Sound, and I was there for about 13 years. Congrats. Yeah. That's amazing to be there for 13 years. But working on The Matrix is an amazing thing to have worked on. I love that film and so do many other people. What were some of the third things that you learned working on The Matrix and how have those lessons helped you even in present day? Well, working with the people that worked on The Matrix, Dane and Julia and Eric, they were just amazing people to work with. And John Rush was the Foley artist at Warner Brothers at the time. And what I learned was how much art actually goes into it, but how much you also have to know technically. Hmm. You know, at the time we were working on Pro Tools, I think it was Pro Tools version five. I don't think you could do surround mixing in the box just yet in version five of Pro Tools. But Dane was such a let's push the technology as far as we can go at the time. And so he was like, let's, let's use technology of pro tools. Let's use this, the sonic technology as our paint. And we're going to use the film as our canvas. And it was nice. just such a, it's just such a different way of thinking for somebody who really didn't have much of an introduction to the world. It was probably the best master class that you could ever get. And it was, it taught me how to think about sound sonically and less as objects, so to say. Right. When Dane was coming up with the sounds for bullet time, I remember we were like, okay, well, what is this going to sound like when you're traveling at the speed of a bullet? You know, and how, how do we create that rush of air that would be happening? How do we create, you know, these sounds that warp with the time warp that's happening there, right? And and it was like, okay, well, let's use planes and whooshes and, and everything like that. And then it was also just a great way of like 
Well, when you're in the Matrix, you know, when they first did go release Neo from the Matrix, it was how, you know, how does this world not comply with the world that we live in, but still be based off the world that we live in, right? Because that's the, that's the Matrix, right? Yeah. It, it's all based on our experiences. So you, we thought about how you ground the sounds, but then bend them and warp them. And, and just the attention to detail. I never thought of how much you can do with attention to detail and the ideas of, you know, during the lobby shoot up scene, we went and smashed a bathroom. One of the other, one of the other sound editors, she was having her bathroom done at the same time renovated and it was marble. And we were like, okay, well, can we get in contact with your contractor? And I remember going with Dane and John Fasal, who's a great sound recorder's, and we went into Julia's bathroom with the contractor and mic'd it up and, you know, all right, we're going to smash this. And, and after we were done smashing it, we took pieces back with us to the studio and we made, I call them wind chimes mm. <laughs> of pieces of marble <clears throat> to add that detail that when you're going through that shooting scene, as the marbles flying past you, we made marble wind chimes to help the sound fly past you. And, and just stuff like that, where Dane taught me so much about <clears throat> how to think about it technically, how to think about it artistically, and how, you know, the the devil does lie within the details of making it so meticulous that you get these great sonic spots happening. It was, it, it was one of those things where, like, where do you go from there as a young mind getting into it? You know, where do you go from there? And sometimes I overthink things I'm almost like, oh, everything's the matrix. Well, no, you know, <laughs> you know, but it it, it was such a, a great way to for me to have the the world of film sound and and sound for picture open up to me. That sounds like such an amazing first gig to get as an intern that's just like a, a dream come true by the sound of things oh so, it, it, it almost was too much it, 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 and sometimes I, I i sit there and question it because as as an intern right like you're you're kind of the lowest person on the i was a fly on the wall on one of the greatest sonic explorations in film right and and, and it's just so so amazing that i got to experience that moment so when you go on a hiatus after being in a project like that, what are the creative things you're doing to fulfill your creative desires? So I, I like to stretch my creative mind. And, and if I don't, my wife gets annoyed with me because <laughs> it's one of those things that if I don't sort of release creativity, I sort of get to be cranky. So, yeah. you know, a lot of, and, and this has actually come up a lot recently because of the recent writers and actor strikes in the U S my work has sort of been very dry since last July. And I know for a lot of people in my industry, it's been dry for even longer than that. So it's kind of like, what do you, what do you do to keep yourself active? So I, I spend, I do it different ways. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I sit in my studio and I create new sounds. I, I learn a new technique to create new sounds. I, I play with synthesizers or samplers and say, how would I approach this? Right. Other things that I do is sometimes even outside of audio. I, I also do photography and I, I study up on how filmmakers do their craft, how cinematographers work so that I can understand their world a little bit more for when we intersect. And the other thing that I do is I, I actually teach. I teach at NYU in the film school and I teach a sound mix workshop. And that helps keep me creative in a different way because I have to try to teach people the mm -hmm. things that I've picked up over the last 24 or so years in my career. And the best part about that is that every student is different. So you have to be creative in how you teach them too, and open up their minds, trying to give them the mind opening experience that I had when I was in school, right? I'm not Dane. I wish I was, <laughs> but I'm trying to keep the Dane, you know, momentum going and, and teaching that that next generation. So th those are the ways I, I try to keep creative to keep myself sane in some yeah. way. And then you have to remember too, though, it is okay to not be creative. And that's also hard for us creatives is sometimes yeah. it's like, no, you just have to sit and veg. Sometimes you, you have to let your brain spin down a little bit because 
if you keep pushing too much, sometimes you you almost break that creativity because you're put you're you're trapping yourself, right? You get yourself into that creative funk, and you can't get out of it until you sort of realize that oh, I have to stop it for a minute and then reapproach. If that makes sense, certainly does. I hear you. I completely understand that one. You have this experience as an intern. You have your hiatus. What is the project that you're doing after this situation? And were you happy about the outcome at the end of it? Okay, so I think I misinterpreted your last question. That you're saying you're sort of going more of my career tra- trajectory of how things went. Um, I guess I th- I'm, I don't think you did. Okay. Misinterpret- <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, <laughs> so I mean. After my internship, after my career got started, after everything's going, I've had I've had so many unique career opportunities. I've worked on every type of program that you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, I've worked on reality TV, the first season of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy that came out. And this is way back in the early 2000s. I got to do sound design and mixing on. I used to work on what not to wear. But then I also got the opportunity to work with Tina Fey on 30 Rock. And un- Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And I've also gotten to work with Tom Fontana on shows like Oz and Borgia. And Tom has done so many other great shows and, and programs out there that I've been lucky enough to sort of move around career wise as far as, you know, whether I'm editing sound effects or mixing or doing a feature film like Carol or doing a show like The Americans. and. You know, it, it's funny because at the time when I'm working on certain things, is it my favorite? No, you know, there are some things where you get frustrated while you're working on things, right? You're, you're you know, I, I came off of the matrix and then I'm working on while you're out or what not to wear. That's a totally different world, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and you sit there going, oh, but looking back on it now, I realize that working on shows like while you're out or what not to wear, which were both reality shows that were sort of very, very run and gun, very verite, very, you know, following people in intense, not intense situations, but they're running around stores and noisy situations. So for sonically, it was hard because yes, they have lav mics on, they have booms, but there's lots of action happening with them running and all this other stuff. I learned a lot of audio tricks from that. So looking back, I am happy with how, everything sort of turned out, you know, and I also am a firm believer of you always learn good or bad. You learn. So even the, the bad experiences I've had through my career, I've taken to be good experiences because I've learned from them. Can you give us an example of when you've really learned from a bad experience? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I had one really recently that I'm still trying to get the lesson from. So I can't really reference that one. <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there are times when you learn what sonically everybody hears the world differently. As much as we all have our hearing, our hearing has been impacted by different things in our lives. And sonically, also, our brains recall what sounds mean differently. So, you know, and that's one of the great things about hearing is that it's a recall function. It's a recall sense, right? You, you hear, we actually go all the way back to ancestors and just instinctually in us, we hear certain sounds and they recall fear or they recall excitement or something like that. So I've learned that you have to appreciate that everybody has a different sonic palette. I, I was on a project one time recently, a feature film, and I, I'm going to keep the name off the record just because it's sort of the right thing to do in, in the industry. But okay. the picture editor, the director, and I all sat down and we had what we call a spotting session where we're spotting through the movie. We're looking at different sections and saying, okay, this is what we want to do here sonically. This is what this is what's happening here. Can you help us with the sound? And so on and so forth. And there happened to be one section of the film that was very objective and it was almost a static shot on a character's face and sonically they wanted to tell a flashback right you weren't going to see 
visually you weren't going to see a flashback, but you were supposed to hear inside the character's head of an event that happened off camera, but during the filming, during the time frame of the film. And so we didn't have any references. We didn't have anything that that we could say, oh, remember when this happened in the film, right? This, this, you know, you went from scene, let's say scene A to scene C and C, scene B wasn't visually represented, but is being sonically represented in scene C. That makes sense. And so it's like, it's like, okay, well, how do we tell this story? How do we tell this sonic story of something that we didn't see? And we thought we came up with a game plan and it was going to be a, a chaotic scene because there's a scene in which there happened to be some violence, right? So we, we needed to make it chaotic, but we all had different, all three of us had different versions of chaotic, but we all agreed on the sound on the, on the idea of chaos. And so I was like, okay, chaos. I wrote it down in my notebook. I got to my workstation. I started working on it. I made what I thought was the correct violent chaos. And I presented it to them and they came back and they said, no, that's too much chaos for us. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so then I dialed it back and, and then I was getting notes separately from the picture editor and the director and the director was saying still too much chaos. And the picture editor was saying the wrong chaos. Right. And so the picture editor was giving me guidance to what they thought was the right chaos. But even though I was following their notes, by the time the director heard it, they were like still too much chaos. And we, we sort of went this way multiple times where, you know, and I realized that it, to me, I, I was like, why am I getting this? It, it feels felt like I was getting it wrong no matter what turn I went. And it's really because the picture editor and the director weren't on the same page either of what chaos was. So I, you know, it seemed like it was all going wrong until finally we were all on the mix stage together. And then when everybody could speak their mind together and sort of be like, oh, okay, now we see, you know, why, why it seemed wrong each time. But eventually we, we got to the right level. Excellent. Yeah. That's interesting. The journey you went on in that situation with other people and the collaboration that's involved in projects such as that. Well, and and that's that's part of the beauty of one of the reasons why I really like where I'm at in our film world, because I feel like sound, we get to be such a collaborative thing, right? Where it's never really about my sounds. It's about my sounds supporting somebody's story. And yeah. somebody's story was just edited by somebody else who put in their spin on the story. So it becomes this, if, if done in the right way, it becomes this great mushy collaboration of mm -hmm. everybody. And that's one of the things that I always try to impart on my students too, because so many film students, so many film schools, just because of the fact that it, it's hard, you, you're trying to teach people how to make this product. That's a team effort, but you have to grade one person on it, right? Because of the way our grading system works. And, yeah. and so it becomes this filmmakers, in school many times think they have to do all the roles all the time. They have to be the producer, the line producer, the boom op, the camera person, the editor, the sound editor. And it's like, no, 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 no. You have to know what all those roles do, mm. but pick one and then trust that the other roles will do their part. Right. If you're going to be the producer or the director of a, of a picture, you know, surround yourself with teammates that you want to collaborate with. And, and that's sort of the, the hard thing to teach is that collaboration effort, but that's the part that makes it so worthwhile and makes the story so much more powerful because the more perspectives you have in a story, the wider the story can reach and the more impactful it can be on our audience. Completely. And you've described the situation you had with The Matrix and with the reality TV show and this film that you've spoken about now. Can you describe a moment in The Queen's Gambit, which is an absolutely fantastic show, I love to death, where you felt the sound significantly enhanced the storytelling? Well, I the way The Queen's Gambit was approached, we always knew that sound was going to be a part of it. it the funny thing with The Queen's Gambit is I got that job while I was at a holiday 
party <laughs> at a studio in the city. And Eric Hirsch, who is the re-recording mixer for the project, and Greg Schwatlowski, they both worked at this one studio, Goldcrest, in New York. And we were at this holiday gathering, and we got to talking, and I'd never gotten to work with Eric before. And I was like, hey, Eric, I really want to work with you. He's like, actually, I have a project that I've been meaning to reach out to you for. And I was like, okay, right. cool. And it was the Queen's Gambit. And when we first started talking about it, it was so it was like early December of 2019. And one of the things that we had talked about during that holiday party was that Eric was like, look, we're going to be going back and forth with the picture department with our mixes. And so one of the reasons that we were we wanted to team up was because all of us, Eric, Greg and I have all been mixers. We've all been sound supervisors. We've all been editors that we knew all the different parts of the sonic world that we could easily pass back and forth within the same sessions, following the same rules, so to say, sonically. So that way we could just keep building sonically because oh. we knew we we knew we wanted to. We knew that was going to be the gameplay. A couple of things happened during the Queen's Gambit that totally just sent all of that off the rails on my end. And really what happened was the pandemic hit. Oh, right? of course. So, you know, I, I always, I have a home studio that's set up for Atmos and I was in my home studio working and I was supposed to jump onto another project. So I started Queen's Gambit at the end of January of 2020. And I was supposed to jump onto another project in March of 2020. And so I, I was editing from home and Eric was like, here, just get started with the backgrounds of Queen's Gambit. And you know, here's all the episodes that we have edits for right now. Just start cutting with them. And we knew we were going to get picture changes along the way. And so I was doing that. And then the world started getting a little, you know, interesting because <laughs> everybody's <laughs> following what's happening overseas. And we're going, OK. And and, you know, I still thought so. Queen's Gambit sort of slowed down on my end where I wasn't, I was supposed to get the next episode or supposed to get a new picture cut. And it was like, ah, this is being delayed for right now. And it was like, okay. But we kind of always knew that sonically it was going to be an important part. Sonically, we were going to mess, not mess is the wrong word. Sonically, <laughs> we were going to enhance, not mess with people's minds, but enhance their perception of the, the visuals and so, you know, that's that's the way we approached it. What ended up happening was in March when the pandemic hit, I thought I was jumping onto another project and had to say goodbye to Queen's Gambit partway oh. through. And they continued on without me. But of course, everything sort of shut down for two weeks. And the project that I was supposed to jump onto disappeared instead of coming on in two weeks like it was supposed to during our shutdown. And then Queen's Gambit had already refilled my role by that point with Patrick, I believe. And so when I came back, I did actually get to finish out Queen's Gambit. I only got to, I got through like the, the midway point, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the whole plan and, and obviously the, the plan went as accordingly because it is such a beautifully sonic job of how it mm -hmm. went through and what Wiley statement did with it. And what Greg and Eric finished it with was just amazing. And it, what was funny though is when I had seen it, we didn't have all the visual effects. So oh, every, okay. every time, every time Beth looked up at the ceiling, all I saw was a shot of the ceiling, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and at that time, you know, I wasn't putting in those effects. I was, I was putting in the backgrounds and, and setting up ambiences and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We weren't obviously doing spot effects yet, but it was kind of like, <laughs> I can't wait to see what goes here. It's kind of like actually when I was working on the matrix, there are many times we didn't have the visual effects. In fact, the first shot of the film that I saw was when Keanu Reeves's character was being pulled out of the goo after he'd been released from the matrix. Yeah. Uh, and that's why he was bald and hanging there in slime. And I'm like, what is happening? But you saw nothing except for Keanu hanging there with a green screen around him when I first saw it. So it was, it's kind of interesting sometimes when we, when we work, even my most recent project that was released, which is Mr. and Mrs. Smith on Amazon. Oh, yeah. Another brilliant, brilliant one. Yeah. yeah. But when I was cutting in certain sounds, you know, because of the way the timeline was, 
I didn't have visual effects and they weren't going to have visual effects until they got to the final mix and I wasn't going to be at the final mix. So it was one of these things where, you know, they'd be like, we want the gun to be going like this. And I'm like, okay, I'll make the gun going like that, but I have nothing visually to support me on my end. So it was sort of interesting when it was released, you know, last Friday or whatever on the second, you know, I watched it. I'm like, all right, my gun works perfectly with how they did the visuals. I'm glad that that all timed out right, you know. So was there a situation in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, for example, that this was most challenging for sound design for you? Because I remember in the episode I saw, I think it's the, the second episode, there's explosions. Uh, sorry, if, uh, spoilers alert, anyone. There's explosions and they're, they're running and they're, they're talking as they run. What was that situation like for you? So Mr. and Mrs. Smith, the, it was challenging actually in, in sort of the opposite way. In some ways, explosions and gunfire are almost a little, I don't know, maybe just because I've done so many of them in my career that they they sort of are like, okay, cool. Let's, let's see how we can make this a unique explosion. Mr. and Mrs. Smith is such a well-paced show. It's almost, it's very reminiscent sonically for me as the Americans where you have these moments of almost silence. Mm. And those actually can be a little more challenging because how do you make those moments still sonically interesting to keep the viewer engaged now obviously you have the dialogue the dialogue is is going to be the top tier of it right and the dialogue in mr and mrs smith is wonderfully written wonderfully acted so we don't have to do but sonically you still have to keep that dialogue grounded in reality yeah. and, and keep the world still alive but allow the dialogue to stay where it is so we had a lot of these scenes where it would go you know for a couple of minutes you know there there was a scene in the first episode where they're sitting in a park talking yeah and it's like you have all this action happening in the park so you're kind of covering that sonically but yet you don't want to get too much so that it's hard to hear their words and how do you keep it lively for this long without being too much that was sort of that was to me sound effects wise that was the the challenge with mr and mrs smith the gunshots super fun they did have a couple sequences in there that throughout the series that you're just like oh my goodness when is this going to stop because i'm cutting guns for like i think there's (laughs) one sequence in uh it might be the fifth episode there's an episode with ron perlman in it and there's mm-hmm. one sequence in there that it is probably like it's a car chase with gunfire. And I think it took me two to three days just to do this sequence. And I think ultimately it's like maybe five minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> right. But there's so much happening in it. And so, you know, you you have to you know, follow the movement of the cars, follow the movement of how the camera is with the cars for perspective, have these gunshots going on, make sure that there's space for when the actors are speaking the dialogue, that that space can exist. And and yeah, that, that was probably the most, probably one of the most challenging parts was just because it was this really intense sequence that I think it was the longest car chase sequence I've done. I did do a car chase in the Americans the first season, I think or the third season, I can't remember that we, I think it might've been the third season that we called it the world's slowest car chase. (laughs) And that one was also challenging for opposite reason, because it's like, how do you make, and it was, it was really because they were going slow because they were trying not to draw attention to themselves. Right. Which which is the opposite of what's happening in Mr. and Mrs. Smith. That one's like, Oh, we're getting away from the people who are chasing us. This one was like, we're going to slowly try to get away from the people who are chasing us because we don't want them to know that they're actually chasing us. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like they're they're tailing us, but if we go fast, then they know we're bad sort of thing. And so that one was, was, you know, another interesting challenge because it's like, how do you make a slow car chase exciting? (laughs) Right. Yeah. That is a challenge. Yeah. And that's where the collaboration comes in though, because the editors do their part. The, the, you know, the, the writers did their part. They, they came up with this sequence and then the editors do their part of after taking the filming and making it work. And then it's like, okay, now we got to support that. And, you know, the great thing about sound is, you know, we instinctually know when something doesn't feel real. 
Mm. Right. And we can also use that though, because if we, if we take and set things up as real, that our brains can accept it sonically, we can then change it sonically to make it more exciting to make it more unusual. We can make those unusual things mean something to us, right? Recent where I did this sort of twist was in the patient, which happened to be by the same people who did the Americans. And I'm so lucky I get to work with them. Um, Excellent. But in the patient, we had this whole sequence and it's come up in a, a couple other times about urination. And okay. so there's this whole story part of the patient where one character he comes in and he follows this routine every time he comes in he finishes his cup of coffee it's in a, in a disposable cup finishes his cup of coffee he smashes the lid into the coffee cup he goes into his other room off camera throws it in the garbage goes and urinates in the bathroom right and we use that as our timing mechanism because a couple episodes in it becomes that sequence of events becomes very important for another character to do something while the first character is off urinating. And he knows that it takes this man about, you know, whatever amount of time to urinate. So we use, we, we change the urination to change your perception of time. Excellent. Yeah. It's all that. Well, I mean, the, the the writers, Joe and Joel, really came up with the idea that this is what – this is a sequence that's going to happen. Yeah. And we were like, okay. And as we got into it, we're like, okay, so we're going to use this sequence. And depending on how long we have it go is sort of your your measurement of time. It's almost like our bullet time. <laughs> except it's our urination time <laughs> <laughs> and and we use it to sort of stretch or contract the time of which events happen and and really it was joe and joel who came up with the idea and we just supported it and and figured out how to you know we we had many talks about how long does it take the average person to urinate we've had many talks of how strong <laughs> and how weak urination can be and, and sort of explored many bathroom behaviors to to figure out how we can make this timing actually work out. But we also, you know, it's funny because again, everybody has their own routines. It was funny of like, okay, well, you know, when they're done urinating, do they put down the the toilet seat? Do we hear that too? Is that part of this sequence? Do they flush and then wash? Do they wash and then flush? Do they, you know, like yeah, yeah. It, it, the conversations we have in the sound world can astound people sometimes the, the oh, i'd love to be a fly on the wall i could imagine there's an episode of the americans where toiletry came into context too where there was one episode where they elizabeth and philip took a Mossad officer hostage and he had to use the restroom at one point. And of course they can't just take him anywhere to use the restroom. And so they're in this abandoned building and he has to go in bucket and stuff like that. And then we're discussing, well, what does it sound like when you go to the bathroom in a bucket? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, so we, we, we were always creating, you know, different sonic scenarios. And of course it's not just what does it sound like? It's what will people recognize? Yes. Yes. And right? in terms of, like what people will recognize and time, for example, and, and, and periods. If you work on a period piece like the Queen's Gambit, you know, how does that influence your choice con compared to working on contemporary settings in American Rust? Well, so that is a great question because that always affects how we approach things. Queen's Gambit actually, time period wise, isn't that far off now there were some things where like okay hey, the cars sound a little different right yeah. same with carol right carol took place back in in a earlier time period probably closer to the beginning of the queen's gambit where the cars are older a little clunkier don't have not don't have as nice mufflers as we do nowadays whereas american rust being very contemporary you're going to see more cars that we're used to seeing your backgrounds in American Rust can have more traffic happening and have more modern traffic happening. Whereas in a piece like Queen's Gambit or Carol, 
you have to be careful. Your traffic has to be older cars. So you might have mm -hmm. to build it because you don't actually have traffic from those days, right? So you might not take recordings of older cars and make your own traffic, so to say. What gets even harder is when you go back. I did a show for Tom Fontana for Netflix called Borgia. Happened to come out at the same time as the Showtime show, The Borgias. Very confusing time. Everybody was into the you know 15th century Pope at the time. I don't know why, but they were. But doing Borgia, right? That's a period piece that took place way back in like the 15th century where, you know, you had no cars, you had no planes, you had, you know, it also took place in Italy. So you had all these differences that you had to account for that, you know, if I went outside and recorded a wind to use in Borgia, I'd have to be really careful that there wasn't a plane or a lawnmower or a leaf blower yeah. happening. Whereas in American Rust, I wouldn't have to worry about that. In Queen's Gambit, I kind of had to worry about it, depending on the type of plane, depending on the traffic, right? I had to make sure there were no leaf blowers because they didn't have them back then, right? Oh, so yeah. that's yeah. what you have to kind of, you do have to take these things into account of, you know, there are certain things, right? It's it's kind of a sound trope that New York City always has a siren, right? Yeah. And well, New York City and Carol time, the siren's very different than New York City now, right? So you have to be careful what sirens you had going. You had to be careful, you know, what kind of what kind of things that you used to say, oh, this is a city, you can't necessarily use them the same way, which is, for me, is fine. I, I, I like breaking outside of the tropes. I like breaking outside of the idea of what, oh, the cliche. I, I don't mind breaking the cliche. Like, Recently, my cousin actually complained to me because, you know, their dog reacts to other dogs barking. Yeah. And they're like, why is it every time in a show when somebody goes outside, there's a dog barking in the soundtrack? Because then my dog goes nuts. <laughs> and I'm like, I always try not to always put in the dog bark. <laughs> but people are like, oh, we got to put a dog bark in here. It's kind of boring. And, you know, you kind of wish you could come up with other things. But yeah, so the, those are the sort of things that you have to think about with the time period things is, is really what existed and what yeah. didn't exist, you know, and, and if something did exist, did it sonically have the same palette that it does now, like cars, right? Cars existed in the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, right? But they were very different style cars, very different engine sounds, right? Completely. And and now we're getting to, you know, with the electric cars where you're getting the more contemporary stuff. It's like I was cutting a show the other day, a short. And uh, there were Teslas and I'm like, well, OK, I guess I'm putting in tire sounds like, <laughs> you know, there's not much else you can really do. So, it, it you know, we're getting to this other age where we're almost going back to the less traffic sound. Right. Like I, I, yeah. maybe in another 10 years, traffic sound will just be. Whew, <laughs> if we're lucky if we're lucky right you know and, and how did the evolution of sound technology influence your work from the early days to your more recent productions such as the queen gambit and american rust and mr and mrs smith yeah so i'm probably on the tail end of the analog days i i actually remember learning how to cut analog tape with a razor and razor blade and splicing it that way and taping it back together to make a soundtrack. But I was also at the very beginning of Pro Tools days where I worked on version Pro Tools version three and four and five. And, and now all I do is Pro Tools. In fact, I haven't touched analog tape in I don't know how long. So, and for people who don't know, Pro Tools is sort of the accepted digital audio workstation in the industry. There are many others out there that are great also but pro tools was one of the, the first that got a strong hold on the industry and it's it's a very powerful tool but even in my career just in pro tools and just the way digitally how we work technology has made it so that i can do things so much quicker so much more detail than before just because the way budgets and time frames work so yeah. even from even from the queen's gambit to mr and mrs smith my workflow has changed dramatically to increase my productivity. There, there's tools out there made by a company called Krotos. And what's great about Krotos is they make 
sound design, sound editing tools that you can perform with. And so even going from the Queen's Gambit going into American Rust, I had bought Krotos tools at that point. And there's a scene in American Rust where there's a character running across a frozen lake and then he falls into the lake and has to swim underwater and, and all this other stuff. Now, water scenes traditionally always took a long time because you have to go and find the water recordings and you have to take them. And of course, the water recordings aren't necessarily timed up right. You have to sort of edit them to make them time up right. And then you have your Foley artist and they go and they record water. But even that, they're recording their water in either a giant swimming pool type thing or a giant tub or something like that. And, and it works, but you're, you're constantly trying to fudge things back and forth to, to make them fit. What I was able to do with Krotos and their tool called Reformer is take all my water recordings and put them into Reformer and have it analyze them. And it analyzes them and maps them to modulation. So then I could take my microphone and trigger this new analyzed water recording. So it could be, I think it was, I made a, a library in Reformer of 20 something water sounds. And then I just perform them with my vocals. So with my microphone, mm -hmm. I would just say swim. But what you would hear is water going. Mm -hmm. That was the worst water sound I could make with my mouth, but I could just, I could say swim and it would move the water in a certain that way. That is unbelievable. Oh, it's it's really cool. There is I there's a YouTube video, I believe it's on Kronos's YouTube channel and my YouTube channel, I believe, in which I demonstrate this because it was such a mind I'm gonna have to way. Watch the link. Yeah. I can't um, believe that. It it was so great. And and just being able to perform that. And then since then. I've taken new ways of approaching sound where I rather perform them. So whether I'm using Krotos tools like Reformer or Igniter, they have one that you can do car driving with, but you can also make other sort of mechanical sounds with you. They also have one called Weaponizer, which is great for guns. Weaponizer is all over Mr. and Mrs. Smith for the gun stuff. And, but you, I also used it in the patient. And instead of using it for guns, I used it for digging because you can put different sounds on different keyboard keys. And so I could put one sound for the shovel going in on one key, a sound for the shovel, you know, sort of digging in more where you get that scrape on another key coming out of the dirt, on another key and a throw on a fourth key. And I could just play it in time. And what's great with weaponizer is that it cycles through multiple sounds and you can also set it up so it slightly varies the pitch each time. So it's never the same exact sound each time. Mr. and Mrs. Smith also used their new tool called Croto Studio, which is a really powerful tool that I'm helping them develop in which you can extend backgrounds. And instead of having a background that loops, say you have two minutes and you have a five minute scene, right? You normally take your two minutes, put it in and then try to find a point where you can cut it and have it sort of repeat. Well, in Croto Studio, there's a way that I am able to take that same two minutes and it will chop it up into little bits and randomize how it puts them in order. So it never repeats. Stuff so like that. This software, can is it like Adobe Premiere Pro? Is it a monthly subscription or do you have to pay for it? Up uh, they they I believe right now they have a monthly subscription for Croto Studio. There are other tools like Weaponizer, Reformer, Igniter, and Dehumanizer and Concept are all you buy a, a perpetual license. I for, see. Yeah, it's a it's a one time purchase. I mean, it. I did a, a short piece for them last fall that they put up on their YouTube. I I did a scene, a sci fi scene that was probably about two minutes long, but it's, you know, you go inside a, a space shuttle, outside a space shuttle, spa astronaut walking, space shuttle disengages from another space station, flies through a wormhole, all this stuff. And I performed all the sounds with their Krotos tools and covered the whole scene. And, you know, it, it's just more the possibility that you can do that. And then you, once you get through that, and, and, and I mean, it took me not even a half a day. And the only reason it took me so long was because I was trying to record this video for them. And yeah. I don't know if you could tell 
I get really excited when speaking and sometimes I stumble. <laughs> so we I had do. to like do a bunch of do-overs for the video. Um, yeah. That's why it took me so long, but it sped it up so much that then I was like, well, if I was doing this in the traditional Pro Tools scenario, I could then add that many more details as I go through with other things and other tools, right? And, and that's what happened with Mr. and Mrs. Smith is the tools that we have now, you know, the car chase scenes in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I used Igniter because it's a car simulation where you can drive a car. You can ramp up oh. the speed. You can ramp down the speed. You can, you can even do car buys if you need to. You could do all sorts of different things with it. So what I would do is I would... To. I would drive the scene with igniter, right? I'd, I'd, I'd watch it and I'd, I'd ride it with my fader. Cause I could m- map the map, the gas pedal <laughs> to, <laughs> to a fader. And so I'd ride it and, and basically perform the driving. And then I'd get a feel for, okay, this is how the scene's going. And then I'd go back in and refine it with igniter a little bit. And then I'd go back in with my sound library and add other layers on top to add other details. And like stuff like that. There's also a great tool by Boom Library called Grip, which is really about tires on cars and chassis. So I'd layer that in too, because now you get this detail of tires and stones jumping up from the ground, hitting the car, all those little details that add, you know, just extra amount of sonic candy to your show. But because I can do this so much quicker, I can add more sonic candy. Now you do have to be a little careful because just like candy, you don't want to make it too sweet. Right. Mm. So that's sort of learning of like how much is too much, how much is enough and, and going back and forth with there, but having these tools just makes it so that you have the ability. Whereas before it was like, Oh my God, I got to get a car. And Oh my God, I just, any car will do. Now it's like, (laughs) it's like, (laughs) okay, I see where this is going. Now I can do this. Now I can do that. You know, James, thanks so much for this information. This is priceless. I'm going to put it in the show notes for everybody to take a look and listen to and listen to the tutorials and try and get the subscription if they can, anything else. Because, yeah, I've been in situations, the car one you just mentioned, where I've, I've thought that when I'm working on a project, I'm thinking, well, well how's this guy, how am I going to say to him to go and, grab a Toyota car from the seventies the when you know no one in London really has cars from the seventies anymore. It's just the, the new cars seem to just last longer. I don't know, but um, how am we going to do this? So what are we going to do? But if, now I know of, of the software options you've said in the future is going to make things a lot easier for me to discuss these things with people that I'm working with. And yeah, you're- I mean, you can do all sorts of things and there's other modulation tools too. Like there's envy by cargo cult, which is you can take, they used it in Ted Lasso amazingly. I um, love that show. You could take different sonic imprints and have them modulate other things. So in Ted Lasso, the example is the wanker chant in the stadiums. Yeah. They had their loop group actors go into a studio and chant wanker, right? Now it's usually eight people for the loop group, right? Mm-hmm. They're just background voices. They come in, they do wanker. Well, now you need to make it sound like a stadium. So the supervising sound editors for Ted Lasso went and took the stadium roars that we have in libraries, right? Right. And they put it in envy and they used the wanker chant from the loop groupers to modulate the stadium roar. So by modulating, it's now having it follow in pitch and in amplitude. So that roar now becomes... And that's how you get this huge stadium, but still have the definition of hearing individuals say wanker because you still hear the original wanker, right? Now I'm saying things like original wanker. It sounds weird, but <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many great tools out there that we can do these things. There's a tool called Sound Particles that I used a lot in American Rust because it took place in Western Pennsylvania. And, you know, it's a lot emptier out there as as far as country and sounds mm-hmm. and we also just didn't want to have like woods full of birds even though woods tend to be full of birds forests tend to be full of birds we wanted to cut that down a little bit so i went and found what birds would be in the area by using cornell's database of ornithology and i found out what birds would be in the area i found their bird calls in different sound libraries 
And then I put them into sound particles. And what you can do with sound particles is each sound can be treated as an individual object particle that is generated randomly in a random spot. And so I can make a field of birds at the pace that I wanted them to be at. So I could say, for example, take this robin and over a two minute period, only play it five times. And over that five times, I want it to be in a different place each time. So closer to the microphone, further away from the microphone, to the left, Mm -hmm. to the right. And you can even do it in surround. So put it in the rear speakers too. And I created my own field of birds for American Rust. And I've been doing that for a couple of projects where it's like, okay, I I need to control this environment more. I can't just take a recording that I did and put it in. Because the thing is, like, you know, people are always... You you could go and record it. And I did this on a number of projects that happened in New York, right? People were like, we need it to sound like New York City. And I'd put in New York City sounds. And they'd be like, that doesn't sound like New York. There's birds. Well, there are birds in, birds New, York. in New York. Yeah. But, so I'd go outside with my recorder and record for two minutes and come back in and be like, this is the sound I just, just recorded and play it for them, right? And so, and that's where, you know, we were talking before about our challenges, right? The challenge is you tend to pick what you pay attention to sonically, right? In New York, we tend to drown out the subway. We tend to drown out the the rush of crowds. We tend to not think about the fact that there are birds there. Yeah. Because we're so focused on other things. We're focused on not getting hit by bike messengers, right? (laughs) (laughs) So we're not, our brain can only take in so much information. But sonically, those things do exist. So then it's like, well, do you mean you want it exactly how it is in reality, which would then include this? Or do you want the feeling that you get sonically from New York, right? Do we make it sound oppressive? Do we make the city sound like it has a rumble and a growl to it? Or do we allow the city to breathe, right? And and it goes for, I use the city just because it's an easy example because people tend to think that they don't have birds, but we can put birds in there. Or do you want them out? Because birds tend to signal happiness to some extent, unless you use yeah. crows. Everybody associates crows. Crows get a bad rap. They you know? do. Um, but so like you, you got, that's, that's one of the challenges is figuring out like, do you want it? You know, I, I had a documentary filmmaker who's like, I want the real sounds. And I was like, you don't. <laughs> but I'll put, in, I'll, I'll put in the real sound. And then luckily I also cut in what we call like the Hollywood sounds. It was a war documentary. Yeah. And we get to the big war sequences of B-roll footage. And he's like, that tank doesn't sound, that's not what the tank sounds like. I'm like, actually that is the sound of that tank, but you want it beefed um, up. So give me a second. And, you know, I put in the extra, extra designed tank that beefs it up and makes it, because he wanted the power of the tank that's associated yeah, I could with the imagine. Tank, right? And but the recording of the tank was pretty wimpy. You know, same mm. with gunshots, right? Uh, gunshots have such a because of how horrific they can be, they they put a different note into our head of what they sound like. But gunshots in reality don't always sound as dangerous as they actually are. Yeah. So, you know, the Hollywood gunshot is always amped up. Right. But you always have people, I want the sound of that, that of that gun. Eh, you don't want the sound of a 22. Trust me. <laughs> it sounds like a firecracker. Like, <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's uh, not what people are going to want. But James, right. thanks so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. I know the listeners have learned a lot. I certainly have learned a lot. And well, I'm looking I- forward to geeking out on those software, on the latest software that you've told us about it. Yeah, we'll they have you back anytime. Amazing. If you have any questions with it, just let me know and we'll get you straightened out. Oh, I really, really appreciate that. And I suspect I will be asking you some questions. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent.